Okay, can you hear me? I can, Robert. Nice okay. to hear you. All right. We, we lost you for a bit. So, so what's wrong with you? <laughs> uh, let's see. I didn't want to leave uh, La Jolla sunshine for Washington, D.C. Um, so a number of things going on, but, uh, um, you know, it would have made Montezuma proud. <laughs> Well, let me, let me quickly ask you, because we don't have a whole lot of time, let me ask you about what I guess is one of your, you have a whole list of things that, you've, that you're doing, and, but the one that intrigues me maybe the most is this uh, notion of a minimal cell. For, uh, first of all, could you explain what a minimal cell is? Well, we've been uh, trying to work on this uh, since 1995 when we sequenced the first two genomes in history trying to understand just fundamentally is there a minimal set of genes that can be responsible for complete self-replicating life. And so we've been working on this for a long time. Uh, we've uh, had our first synthetic version in 2010, as you know. Yeah. We've been working since then to try and design a cell from scratch that uh, has just the minimal set of genes necessary for living and replication, at least in a laboratory environment. So we, we humans have about 20 to 30,000 genes. You started with a little itty bitty thing and you tried to make it ittier and bittier. How, right. how low did you go? So uh, that's put in a, a way only you can put it, Robert, but uh, uh, yes. Um, so. The, the smallest uh, organism uh, set of genes is uh, one we sequenced in 1995, Mycoplasma genitalium, has a little over uh, uh, 500 genes. 500. Uh, the goal is, and the problem with this whole field, is uh, our fundamental knowledge of biology is so limited uh, that we don't know what about 20% of the genes can do. So it's uh, trying to do a design when you don't know what 20% of the parts do. All you know is they're absolutely necessary. So to, I, I to think know I told you this story before I was up in Seattle as part of my book tour, and my uh, late uncle, uh, who was part of the, uh, led the Boeing design team for the 767, I said, imagine if designing Boeing airplanes, they didn't know what 20% of the parts did. He said, what makes you think we knew? <laughs> so uh, let me just, this is a kind of interesting idea. You take the genes that you have chosen as, you think these are the ones that are necessary for life, you shoot one of them, and then you look and say, well, is it still alive? You shoot another one, is it still alive? You shoot another one, is it still alive? So where are you now in the, sh in the shooting gallery? How <laughs> I, I, I think, uh, so the problem with that method, and that's a pretty good description of what we've done, it turns out, uh, and it's important for life, uh, there's dual pathways and dual systems that ha haven't yet been totally recognized uh, by uh, modern science because it's hard to get funding to study these things. Mm. But you can knock out a gene uh, that when you knock it out on its own, uh, it doesn't kill the cell. Uh, but if you knock out its unknown counterpart, uh, you can do that. So. If we use the airplane analogy and you're in a, a 777 aircraft, you can lose one engine and the airplane keeps flying. And so you could say, well, maybe engines aren't really necessary until you lose the second one uh, and you find out, in fact, they were very important. <laughs> so uh, it turns out people thought by knowing the structure of a set of genes that they knew all the functions. So. We thought intellectually we could say, well, we don't need that particular function, so we can knock it out. But genes have multiple functions, and uh, their counterparts have, uh, uh, it turns out, key functions that we weren't aware of. So it's been more than just trial and error. First, we did it totally by design, and that didn't get us a living cell. And so we started adding back components. Uh, we had two different teams, one working on, as you said, the shooting them one at a time. Uh, we added them back at one at a time in sets. Uh, we built these in five different cassettes. And so we could test that one cassette, but you test it in the environment of all the others. It looks like it works uh, because there was a counterpart unknown gene in one of the others that counter counteracted it. So this is just trying to get uh, below 500 or so genes. 
I'm, I'm right. so we glad that this is hard. Uh, right? so, yeah, I'm just so glad that this is hard. I, I, I'm, I, you know, you were starting at 99. I was, because this is a little bit like God. I mean, it's, you know, there's clay, God goes, and then there's Adam. So it should at least take you, I hope, 10 years to figure out the part. Exactly. It's, it's taking us maybe a while longer. Um, uh, you might remember Stephen Colbert asked me uh, why I thought I could do better than God. And I said, well, we have computers. <laughs> uh, well, let me ask you this. What would you do? Assuming, I assume that if you get a cell that you can boot up from uh, store-bought ingredients and you can create a life form. It's a very simple life form. Why do we need one? Uh, well, we don't need one per se for that. It's a proof of principle. But if we actually want to do design for building new organisms to make uh, new vaccines, new medicines, uh, food sources, etc., uh, we want to get down where we can actually do design on first principle basis. So the other thing we're doing, other than uh, trying to make a minimal genome, we're trying to defrag the genome. If you think of it as computer uh, analogies, uh, four billion years of evolution is pretty messy. Things get inserted all over the place, and there's no real logic to it. There's a lot of randomness. But if we're trying to do design where we want to put in a cassette for genes that do sugar metabolism versus uh, methane metabolism, We'd like to do that if just you plug in this cassette and you have the energy production for the cell. So we're defragging the genome as well, trying to reorganize it. And that's a lot more complicated than it might seem as well. But uh, the point is to get to where we can start to do design uh, from known components to start to build new things for the future. So these are the early baby steps that allow us to start accelerating uh, the design and building of new organisms for very specific manufacturing purposes. Well, let me run through some of those purposes. Uh, you were thinking of maybe pollution-eating bugs, fuel-producing bugs that urinate diesel or gasoline, yep. uh, toxin-eating bugs, medicine-producing bugs. Um, you would then put them in the air and the water and the land. Now, the first question that comes to my mind is, um, how, how, how hungry are we about to be, or how energy needy, or how anxious for fresh water, that this would be something that politicians would bless? Do we need this? Well, uh, you're, you're, let me correct your earlier statement. Our plan uh, is not to add them back to the environment. Uh, I think that would be a mistake to do. Uh, as you know, we've... Uh, sailed around the globe taking samples every 200 miles in the ocean and sequ sequencing the organisms there. Over 40% of our oxygen comes from uh, those algae. We would not want those replaced by algae that produce a whole lot of oil and uh, instead of oxygen give us a oily goo uh, in the ocean. So these would be organisms that in fact would not live outside the laboratory or outside a production environment. And, that's an important part of our design is building kill switches into these so they can't survive on their own. Uh, but we're thinking of industrial manufacturing, industrial applications. So for example, with uh, sugar as a feed, you can convert that sugar almost into anything. We're working on designing uh, new pathways that don't exist in nature for making the chemicals that go into plastic bottles. Right now that comes from oil. It's a byproduct of oil production. Uh, so it's adding to the pollution of taking oil out of the ground. Uh, we burn some of it, others we turn into chemicals and carpets and plastic bottles. Uh, if we make those uh, same chemicals from sugar, we convert it into a, a renewable uh, chemical uh, and are able to recycle uh, all the waste and reuse them. So we can also make them, uh, we have algae that grow out here in the desert uh, and these ponds that we have at Synthetic Genomics that use sunlight and carbon dioxide. So they're pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere. In fact, we need high doses of CO2. We have to concentrate it and pump even more in. Well, wait, let me interrupt the you. CO2 into all these different chemicals, including foodstuffs. Let me ask you about scaling, because you're talking about little, little things 
but we need a lot of fuel, or we need to remove a lot of CO2. Is it a simple matter, once you've proven the concept, to scale up? Uh, unfortunately, none of this is simple. Um, probably the hardest goals are going to be new, really high-throughput fuel uh, that can compete with the cost of natural gas now and the lowering of, of oil. Every time uh, new biofuel approaches came along in the past, all of a sudden the cost of uh, uh, carbon out of the ground uh, gets cheap again. That's what makes it impossible uh, to compete. Uh, the only way it can ever compete is if governments actually create a carbon tax. Uh, so we start to realize it doesn't matter how cheap it is to burn coal or oil or natural gas. Uh, in the long run, we can't afford to keep doing that. At that stage, yes, it can be scaled up very dramatically. Uh, it's not cost effective uh, to do so now. But let it me, is let cost me, effective let me ask you for a, food substances. It's cost effective. Uh, for specialty chemicals, uh, for vaccines, etc. Let me ask you a, a, a lifestyle question. If you're running out of food and you can create a bug that makes more food, or you're running out of water, fresh water, and you can make a bug that creates more fresh water, or you're running out of energy and then you can make more energy, uh, there's, a, there's a kind of a theme here, more, more, and more. The alternate approach, it seems to me, would be to do less, have fewer babies, eat less, buy less, live more gently on the earth. It strikes me a little bit like you're in the more, you're a more guy. Well, we're trying, you know, I can only control how many babies people have in my own local environment to some extent. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know how to do that uh, globally. Um, we, we have a tremendous challenge with uh, all the people that we keep adding to the planet. Uh, Within uh, not too long, we could be approaching 10 billion people. Uh, it's not sustainable uh, with uh, the approaches we're using in consumption of everything now. More is the problem. Um, we can have uh, less babies, but uh, unless we're going to roll back populations, which I don't think anybody is truly advocating, at least not in the political arena, uh, we have to find solutions to produce more food, more medicine, not at the expense of the environment, but in a recyclable, uh, sustainable fashion. That is doable. We can support the number of people uh, that we do have, but only if we change how we do it. My last question to you, because we're almost out of time, I, I hesitate to do this, but I am curious about the Ebola story right now. Just rather quickly, when you watch that story, since you have been involved, in virology and, and dealing with bird flu as well. What are we doing right at the moment about Ebola and what do you think we're doing wrong? Well, Ebola is primarily a public health management problem. Uh, it's, uh, there's been numerous outbreaks in the past and they've all been managed by a really good uh, containment. Uh, because of the location and uh, on the borders and uh, in a war area, those containment issues uh, kind of fell apart uh, and it started spreading around. Uh, Ebola is not a lethal disease most of the time. I think a, uh, I, I understand a group at Harvard has been uh, working a treatment in Africa and they're down to around 12% mortality just by using good medical practices. Um, Yes, it would be great to have a vaccine. Yes, it would be great to have drugs to treat it. Uh, but containment is the most important thing initially uh, with new outbreaks. Obviously, in the future, as we've done with the flu vaccine, we can synthetically make a vaccine very quickly for flu. We can email it around the world. You can use one of our devices to print it. Uh, and if that can be given locally, we should be able to stop future flu pandemics uh, from ever spreading, uh, that has to be done the disease by disease. I would, uh, love, I would love to tell the audience about, this guy has, is working on a digital biological converter 
which can make, if somebody is sick and pooping and vomiting and stuff, you can scoop up the poop, you can assay what's in the poop, you can figure out what the virus is, you can transfer the genome of the virus to a lab anywhere in the world, they can come up with a vaccine and they can send it to you back digitally and then you can make it where you live one day, one day soon, one day never, one day maybe. Well, one day soon we can actually do that right now with new emerging flu vaccines. Uh, the U.S. now has a stockpile of the H7N9 vaccine. BARDA has led this effort in the U.S. government. It's the first synthetic uh, DNA-based vaccine uh, that uh, my team at the Venture Institute in Synthetic Genomics did with Novartis. Uh, it proves the paradigm can happen. So we have a stockpile of this new vaccine before the single first case of this has occurred in the U.S. So for the first time, we're ahead of the game instead of trying to always play catch-up. It's a matter of in each of these infectious disease, working out the right basis of a vaccine. One size does not fit all, uh, but the future will be rapidly emailing these around, downloading them, uh, and blocking transmission uh, very early on, and we should be able to eliminate future pandemics. Well, Santa Claus has very little on this guy. His presents are huge and fascinating. We're out of time, Santa, but... Uh... I, I, everybody say goodbye to him applause-wise so he can hear you. <laughs>